Hey there, good morning, everyone. My name is Susan Graham, and I am the new Chief Development Officer for the Wolf River Conservancy. I'm still very new at the Conservancy, and there are so many donors and volunteers I have yet to meet. However, I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you tonight in this virtual realm and look forward to meeting all of you in person during the coming months. Let me welcome you to tonight's lecture series, which is part of our ongoing educational outreach to the community. We are very excited about tonight's program, Gardening for Butterflies and Other Pollinators with local butterfly expert, Bart Jones. I'd like to acknowledge all of our benefactors of 2023. Thank you to the Crawford Howard Family Foundation, AutoZone, FedEx, Hyde Family Foundation, International Paper, Jim Karras Subaru, Ring Container Technologies, and Solvamo for their ongoing support. Of course, all of our supporters, corporations, individual donors, and volunteers are critically important in allowing us to deliver on our mission, the protection and enhancement of the Wolf River and watershed as a sustainable natural resource. As always, gifts of any size are appreciated. Look for the donation link in the chat box. And then a few housekeeping details. We ask that you please do not attempt to record this tonight. We will record tonight's program and we'll be sending you a link in an email following tonight's program. If you have questions during the program, please use the Q&A feature, not the chat box. Our education director, Kathy, will answer any, will ask the questions after the program. Now, it's my pleasure to pre present to you our speaker for this evening, Mr. Bart Jones. Growing up in Parsons, Tennessee, afforded Bart the luxury to indulge his curiosity of all things science and nature. The forest, streams, and fields surrounding his home became an outdoor laboratory where no wildflower, rock, or insect escaped scrutiny but it was butterflies that held a special interest for him. That passion for butterflies was rekindled about 18 years ago when Rita Venable invited him to participate in a North American Butterfly Association count. Bart now conducts counts throughout West Tennessee as well as helping others. After receiving a degree in biology from UT Martin, Bart made his home in Memphis where he is employed at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital as an associate scientist in the Department of Infectious Diseases. Besides his professional work and butterfly activities, he is a past president of the Tennessee Native Plant Society, as well as a member of many other botanical societies and local conservation groups. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Bart to our virtual stage tonight. Bart. Thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here with everybody tonight. Um, I wanna thank the other people involved with uh, coordinating this. Um, Kathy and Rhea, and uh, it's my pleasure to try to pass on a little information about gardening and butterflies to you tonight. So I guess I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, does everybody see that okay? We sure do. All right. So we'll start. Um, so uh, everybody is interested. Uh, I'm sure most people are familiar with Doug Tallamy uh, and some of the books that he's uh, written. And he is a very big proponent of creating your own natural areas and uh, in your backyard with gardening and creating like a, a large landscape of little way stations for pollinators to be able to thrive. And so if you're interested in, in that kind of uh, activity, and, and I'm hoping that this will help you with selecting some of the plants that you might need and uh, also some other ideas about things to attract pollinators to your backyard gardens. So why should we care about pollinators? Well, I mean, there's all the ec economic benefit. I mean, most people are familiar with honeybees, even though they're not really a native insect, but they're uh, used commercially to pollinate uh, a vast majority of the food that we eat. And if we didn't have, you know, pollinators, our um, agricultural system would almost collapse. So the economic benefit of pollinators is enormous. And if you have uh, a lot of the native pollinators, it's a good indicator of a healthy ecosystem. And it helps to sustain the native plant communities because they pollinate the native plants just like they do garden crops. So without these pollinators, you wouldn't have 
you know, healthy communities of native plants. And without healthy communities of native plants, you wouldn't have healthy ecosystems for animals and so on and so forth. And then it would eventually come back to, we don't have a good ecosystem. And of course, for uh, especially for butterflies and, and, and some birds that are also pollinators, we can just appreciate the beauty and, and with, with them visiting our gardens, we can appreciate that beauty even more. So what are the major pollinators? It's not just butterflies. Actually, butterflies are not a major pollinator. They're one of the minor pollinators, but bees and wasps do the majority of the work in pollination. But you also have uh, flies and beetles or uh, several flower beetles that specifically eat pollen. And that's, you know, in the process are pollinating a lot of the plants. Uh, and then butterflies and moths come in, but also we have hummingbirds that are fairly su substantial pollinators of some plants that have have evolved to co to uh, co-opt the the um, hummingbird coming for the nectar so they the structures of the flowers have have over evolved over time to be able to fit with a hummingbird so that the pollination can occur all right, so you want to make your butterfly garden. There's a few things that you'll need to have. And of course, first and foremost, you'll need to have nectar plants to bring in your, your butterflies to start with. Uh, especially at the beginning, you want to make sure that your nectar plants are nice and healthy and large. And so you would want to probably buy mature plants to start with. And, uh, and then later on, if you were interested in growing things from seed, then bring seeds in and uh, fill in and increase your garden with the uh, seedlings that you've raised. But you also need to have host plants because once you attract your butterflies in, you would like to ha have the ability to perpetuate generations of, of butterflies within your area, not just depend on them wandering through for your uh, nectar plants. So you'll want to have some host plants to especially attract some of the butterflies that you might be the most interested in or things that you feel need to have help. Uh, so the host plants are very important. You can't forget water. Butterflies need water just like any other animal. And uh, also they need other nutrients and minerals, especially the male butterflies to be able to reproduce well. So you have to bring in some uh, extra mineral and nutrient sources. And then of course you wanna have a good design because you don't wanna have uh, large things overshadowing small things. You wanna have a nice balance and also be aesthetically pleasing to you to look at. So we'll start with some nectar plants and uh, I'm gonna kind of list these by season. So we'll start in the spring plants cause you wanna have blooming plants throughout the year to bring in all the butterflies that are gonna be occurring throughout the year. And I'll include woody plants, trees and shrubs, and then also down to forbs and even small ground covers because you wanna have uh, the layering effect too. You wanna have your vertical height included in your garden. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is redbud, and that's a nice small tree. It usually stays very tidy, doesn't get super big. So it is a good candidate as a small tree for the garden. And in the spring, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the beautiful lavender pink blossoms, and a lot of bees and butterflies are attracted to this flower. And so here's a juniper hair streak that's uh, nectaring on some of the flowers of a redbud. Uh, the leaves uh, are very nice heart-shaped leaves, so even after they've bloomed, they have nice interest within the garden as a tree. And another smaller shrub that is a very good plant to have, especially around here, because we're lucky that red buckeyes love the Mid-South. And this is a, a, a very important uh, plant for hummingbirds as they come back up from Central America on their migration in the spring. It, it blooms coinciding with, with the migration and hummingbirds really use red buckeye uh, as uh, a nectar plant. So they also will pollinate it too as they come uh, through in, in nectar front. But also some of the larger butterflies like tiger swallowtails and spice bush swallowtails, they will also use this as a nectar source. And there's all kinds of flocks to plant some bloom in the spring and some actually bloom into the fall. But uh, this one, a uh, spring blooming phlox is the uh, wild blue phlox or the woodland phlox. Uh, if you go to Meme and Shelby Forest, you'll see uh, the roads will just be lined with this phlox and uh, it's very, very beautiful. It smells really good. So it's a nice uh, 
uh, plant to have for the fragrance. And it's uh, used by a lot of the uh, butterflies, especially the swallowtails and some of the larger skippers. And then for a low growing plant, uh, the violets are a very important source in the spring for uh, butterflies and smaller bees. Uh, people don't think about it. And especially if you live in Midtown like I do, you kind of think of them as nasty weeds because they just are so prolific and they get everywhere. But if you've got a, a natural type garden, just let them go. They're, they're low growing. They don't really crowd out most larger plants anyway. And so they'll kind of give you a nice ground cover. And then by late summer, early fall, the, the plants begin to die away anyway. So they're not that obtrusive. So just let them grow. And then when you get more towards summer, um, not all, you know, I'm not going to talk all about native plants. I encourage people to plant natives, but there are a few things that don't seem to be all that problematic. Uh, some people do talk about budley as being a, an invasive plant. I've never really seen it that invasive, but it's a great butterfly nectar plant. And bees also really uh, enjoy this plant. But a butterfly bush will give you some height and uh, it cut it back in the, in the fall and it goes through the winter and, and then comes back up. So by the summertime, it's kind of grown up above everything else and then starts to bloom and attracting in all the uh, pollinators. And I love coneflower. Purple coneflower is... I think one of the most excellent summer uh, high, um, perennials to plant. Um, and I I really hesitate to say anything about getting hybrids. I mean, it, they've been hybridized and they're so popular now with all the different colors, but I really just don't see those hybrids being able to attract in the things like just the regular species Echinacea purpurea will do. And so if you can get just the wild form native plant it will do the best job, but planting these in mass will really attract in some nice butterflies. And then if you've got a wet spot uh, in your garden that you just can't seem to really do anything with, um, you know, it's hard to mow because it always stays damp, consider putting in button bush. Uh, they've got glossy green leaves and are very attractive even when they're not in bloom, but they have these spiky little balls of flowers that the butterflies just go crazy over. And uh, this was taken at Real Foot Lake, and uh, you can see a viceroy there at the top left and a zebra swallowtail down at the bottom. And usually there's always going to be several butterflies on a, butter on a button bush when you have one in bloom. Also good uh, summer perennials are Monarda and Black-Eyed Susan. Um, I don't think I don't think of black-eyed Susan as, as being that great of a butterfly attractor, but it's a, a real good bee plant, especially smaller native bees. And sometimes we kind of forget about the the smaller things. Uh, and so black-eyed Susan will do a really good job with small bees. And Monarda is great for bumblebees. And then of course all of the butterflies really love the Monarda. And then of course there's butterfly weed. Uh, this was taken at Meme and Shelby Forest, when they had uh, a lot more of their native plants that they had uh, put in place around the uh, visitor center. And so you can see that this is going to really attract in a lot of butterflies. Uh, there's at least two different species of swallowtails here and, and over 30 just on this one plant. So especially if you cut it back down in the summer after it blooms in June, it'll come back and bloom again about this time of year. And it seems to really bring things in uh, in the late summer, early fall, more so than it does in the spring. And then of course, there's some annuals that you can plant uh, that uh, are really good for attracting in butterflies. And zinnias are probably the top of the list. They're easy to grow. You can raise them from seed and um, they're, they're bright, colorful, and lots of different forms and colors. But the big open flowered ones, the kind of like the old fashioned zinnia is probably the best one to get. Uh, the, it seems to have more attracting, attracted uh, the flowers. They, the pollinators are going to uh, utilize those little yellow flowers there uh, in the center. And the more open flowers allow that to be easily accessed. So those are the ones you want to get for your garden. Then, of course, we have lantana. It's a tropical plant. Um, it's um, sometimes semi-perennial if we have a, a mild winter, but uh, it's always known for its uh, attractants to butterflies. Uh, this is a uh, 
sachem, a type of skipper, and uh, but all kinds of things will visit it. And uh, they're easy to maintain and you can kind of keep them uh, in little bush form, little rounded bushes. So if you've got a spot in the garden that you want to have like a little rounded uh, effect of uh, kind of sculptural effect, then this could be a good plant for that. Then we get toward uh, fall and in the fall it's People don't think of the fall as being a good, necessarily a good butterfly uh, time of the year, but actually butterflies keep building up their numbers over the, over the year. So by the fall, you get your peak numbers of butterflies and a lot of the things uh, will migrate other than just monarchs, but uh, they also will migrate to the coast to overwinter. And um, these, these um, fall blooming plants are very critical for those butterflies to be able to maintain themselves on their journey south. And uh, salvias are uh, one really good um, plant that uh, you can grow in the fall. Um, there are a lot of different ones. This is a native that uh, grows uh, in some of the areas around here and in Middle Tennessee, uh, salvia azuria, but a lot of different salvias are available in the horticultural trade. Asters are critical. Um, we have lots of different kinds of asters and they grow in just old abandoned uh, lots in the city. It's a, a really important plant to have uh, corridors through urban areas like big cities. And um, uh, a lot of the asters uh, will allow monarchs to migrate through. I've seen uh, vacant lots in Memphis that had just you know dozens of monarchs on asters that were blooming in them. So. These kind of plants, although they're thought of kind of as weeds, if you trim them up in early summer, they'll branch back out and you'll get an effect that's similar to chrysanthemums. Uh, chrysanthemums also kind of need to be trimmed like that to maintain that round bushy form that people like, but it'll also kind of add to the prolific nature of the blossom when it does uh, start to bloom in the fall. And then the lobelias, um, most people are very familiar with the cardinal flower there on the right, and that's one that is um, uh, adapted for hummingbirds also. And you can tell by the kind of neck with the white pollen at the end of it. So the hummingbird comes in to nectar and it rubs that uh, pollen up against its head. Uh, but butterflies kind of do the same thing and, and it can be their wings that actually capture the pollen. So when they come in to nectar and then take off to fly, they're brushing their wings up against the pollen and then going to the next flower. But there are a lot of different uh, blue lobelias that are native and uh, skippers in particular really like the blue lobelias. And this is a clouded skipper on downy lobelia. And the liatris uh, or the gay feathers, blazing stars, uh, there's a couple that are uh, used uh, quite extensively in the horticultural trade. And um, they're really good. Uh, bees absolutely love liatris and most butterflies do too. And it's a really good tall plant to add to the back of the border. And it adds a lot of, um, of interest in the, in the fall when it blooms. It pairs beautifully with uh, other yellow flowers like uh, goldenrods. So it's something to really think about to bring in. And then you want to bring in some host plants to keep your butterflies in place so that they can reproduce. And uh, every butterfly has, uh, you know, caterpillar host plants. They eat they eat plants, uh, except one butterfly, which eats woolly aphids um, as a caterpillar. But uh, your host plants don't have to be necessarily incorporated into your garden, but you can. And some of them are versatile in that they're also good nectar plants. A lot of the milkweeds are both good hosts and good nectar plants. Uh, but we'll go through a, a few major ones that you might want to think about incorporating and bringing in some of the butterflies that use them. And the first one is our state wildflower, the passion flower. Uh, this is great because it's a vine. And so you can grow it up on a trellis or up against a wall. And that gives you some vertical height, even with uh, within the summer. And this is used by the Gulf fritillary and also the variegated fritillary. So you can have two butterflies using that one and everybody loves the Gulf fritillary because it's such a vibrant red, reddish orange. And sunflowers, of course, uh, 
most people think of the annual sunflower, but there are tons of native perennial sunflowers and they do great in the garden. This is ashy sunflower. It's got a gray green foliage. It's interesting on its own. And then it's got beautiful large flowers for a, a, a three foot tall plant. And uh, it's utilized by the pearl crescent, which is one of our most common butterflies. And then of course the milkweeds, this is common milkweed. Um, there's swamp milkweed, the butterfly weed, uh, aquatic milkweed, uh, tropical milkweed. There's all kinds of milkweeds that you can use in your garden. Um, the common milkweed is the best one as far as producing the the um, the chemicals that the monarch uses to make itself uh, dis distasteful to predators. So it's probably the best one if you want to plant as a host plant. It's a little bit un unwieldy in that it uh, spreads by stolen, so it can it needs to be in an area that's very contained so it doesn't get out and spread everywhere. But uh, it's a, a very nice plant. Flowers smell incredible. And of course, it is the main host for the monarch. But like I said, the other milkweeds will also uh, be utilized by monarchs. But that one has the most of the uh, uh, alkaloids that it uses for uh, predator aversion. And then partridge pea. Uh, a lot of people don't think of partridge pea as something to grow. But I saw uh, someone who had planted partridge peas in a long uh, raised bed. And it was in a, not just a wooden bed that they had made, but a container that was bought, but a long uh, container that they had planted them in. And it was actually gorgeous up against a wall. And this is the uh, host plant for the cl uh, cloudless sulfur, which is a very large, bright yellow, almost lemon yellow butterfly that most people have seen flying around along the roadsides. It's very noticeable. Then, of course, there's uh, a lot of native grasses, and the grasses are very important because there's a whole group of butterflies called the grass skippers that are uh, exclusively feed on grasses, and the native grasses are very important. So instead of planting your um, your ornamental grasses uh, that you would like, um, well, I can't think of the name, but, but the Japanese um, uh, grasses that people plant, um, Try think about trying some of the blue stems. This is little blue stem. There's a large blue stem. There's also Virginia switchgrass. A lot of these things are beginning to come into the trade and being utilized in landscaping. And they basically suffice to do the same effect with clumps of, of foliage, but they're all utilized by these grass skippers. And this is uh, the clouded skipper again. And But there's at least two or three dozen grass skippers that require grass to uh, use for their hosts. And then there's some things that are odd that people really have no idea that are used by caterpillars. Uh, dead leaves. So when you're you're cleaning up your garden in the fall, don't clean everything up. Leave some leaves, not only for uh, the mulching effect and to you know break down from um, uh, adding nutrients to the soil, but also uh, there's a butterfly that uses that. And even just your lawn Bermuda grass, there's a butterfly that is used that specifically uses Bermuda grass. And so the red banded hair streak is the uh, butterfly that uh, uses dead leaves for the caterpillar host. And so if you don't clean up your garden, you'll probably get some red banded hair streaks to show up. Believe me, they're in my garden every year. And then the sachem is a, a skipper that uses Bermuda grass. And it has an interesting cycle of how it feeds. And the reason it's kind of adapted to a lawn grass is at night, they feed, they come up from the you know ground level and feed on the grass. And then when the sun comes up during the day, they go down and, and rest along the ground. So if you mow, you don't you don't get the caterpillars. So they're able to sustain themselves in a in a lawn environment if you don't spray. And then of course there's uh, a lot of trees. Actually, trees are the most important host plants for the majority of butterflies. So it's important to either have trees in your yard that are uh, used as host plants or to have your garden set up in an area that does have a lot of trees nearby and available. Uh, some of the most popular uh, trees for host plants are the poplar and willows, uh, sassafras and spicebush trees, plants, and hackberry trees. And the biggest uh, 
tree for a host plant is an oak tree. There's more, more species of butterflies use oak tree as a host than anything else. And then the elms. And so the Eastern tiger swallowtail is, uh, uses the uh, tulip poplar as the, as the main host plant. It's a little bit of a, an omnivore in that it can use other trees also, cherry trees, um, uh, I think muscle wood, uh, hop horn beam. It can use several trees, but it prefers to use tulip poplar. The red spotted purple and the viceroy are uh, known to use willows. Spicebush swallowtail, as its name implies, uses spicebush, but it will also use sassafras. Hackberry emperor is one of three butterflies that uh, use the hackberry tree as a host. So hackberry emperors, tawny emperors, and American snout. Horace's dusky wing, and almost all dusky wings and cloudy wings, and uh, almost, I would say, a majority of hair streaks are going to use oak trees as their host. And then question mark is one of uh, several butterflies that uses elm trees as a host. So you've got all of the, your plants in place and now you want to uh, bring in your butterflies, but you need to have water and you need to have nutrients and you need to have some minerals available too, because the males are gonna require those to be able to reproduce. The females are good with the sugar from the nectar, but the males in particular are gonna have to have some minerals, some salt. So this is a picture I took uh, at Neiman Shelby. Uh, this is uh, a clump of butterflies that are imbibing on horse dung. And you'll see butterflies a lot of times are attracted to uh, dung and they're attracted to dead animals. Uh, and that's basically to get the salts and nutrients from those sources. And it's not pretty. I don't think you want to have, you know, cow manure in your garden necessarily to track butterflies, but you can substitute that in by having a bird feeder. And uh, not only uh, do you need the nutrients for, uh, for salt, I'll tell you about that in just a second, but there are a whole group of butterflies who do not nectar. They prefer to get their sugars and carbohydrates from uh, rotting fruit. So it's important to have um, pieces of fruit around so that those butterflies can find something to eat. Uh, and then, of course, you can also take the same bird feeder and get a sponge and soak it in Gatorade. And that basically will mimic the saltiness of the water or the dung that they're getting the salt minerals from. So those are two things that you can use to, uh, you know, use on a bird bath that will that will help. Plus, it gives you a source of, of water with the, the Gatorade. And you can put water with pebbles in a bird bath also, just so long that there's an area that they can actually land on that's dry. And then they'll go to the edges of the rocks where it's damp but not covered in water. And they'll get their water that way. And then, of course, you want to think about your design. Uh, you don't want to just willy-nilly plant a plant here and there. Uh, it's important that you uh, place things so that you've got uh, something that may be tall in the center. Uh, then as you get more toward the periphery, plant smaller things. But you can also plant an anchor plant in a corner that's also tall. So you just have to look at your lot, uh, uh, come up with a, a design that you think will fit well. But you do need to include things that you don't, it's typically in a butterfly garden, you don't want to plant just one of something. You want to plant a clump, a group. So most of the time you want to plant at least five or six of the same plant. So because butterflies don't see with that much accuracy, they're not really sharp eyed. The focus is not that sharp. They go toward kind of blobs of color. And when they see a mass of flowers, they'll go to that before they will uh, just happen up upon a single individual flower. So it's easier to bring things in with big masses of color. So you always want to make sure that you're planting at least five or six of whatever type of plant that you want to plant in your garden. Uh, you can also see that there is a flagstone placed in this garden. Uh, in the early morning, in the spring, and in the late fall when the mornings are very cool, uh, butterflies appreciate an open spot that will warm up with the sun quickly. 
Uh, so a nice big flat rock is perfect for them to perch on and warm up because a butterfly really cannot fly until its internal temperature gets to 60 degrees. And so since they're cold-blooded animals, they kind of have to depend on, you know, the temperature around them. But they also uh, are little solar panels. So if they can find a place to open their wings up and they can absorb the rays from the sun and warm their body up quicker than the air temperature. So it's not unusual to see a butterfly flying around and it be 45, 50 degrees. They've been laying in the sun and had warmed themselves up. So having a place like that is important in the garden. Uh, and then, of course, you'll add your water sources, a bird bath there, and then all your plants. And if you've done a good job and taken care of everything, then your garden will look something like this, and you'll be able to enjoy your butterflies. So once you have your garden in place, you're going to have butterflies come in. And we've already talked about several, but I want to go through a few other species that you can expect to come and visit your garden. And these are things that I've I think I've seen every one of these in my garden and I don't even really have that great of a, a butterfly garden, but you know, these are things that are pretty common. Uh, they maintain uh, good populations, even in urban areas. So it's something that you should uh, expect to see in any garden in, in the area. Uh, first one is American snout. It feeds on hackberry. So we know we've got a lot of hackberry trees all throughout Memphis and uh, they love to come to water uh, damp areas. Um, they uh, a lot of times, if you wash your car, or you water your plants, and get water on concrete. You'll these butterflies just show up out of nowhere, and they start to kind of bounce around and then land and and drink some water from where you got the concrete wet. But they'll come into your garden pretty regularly. Uh, cabbage whites are not a native butterfly. There's, there's just a few butterflies that are invasive from other places, and cabbage white is one of them, but we think of it as one of our butterflies. And most people, that's, this is the butterfly you see flying around the neighborhood all the time. And they feed on any kind of uh, mustard family plant, but especially, you know, cabbage, which it gets its name from. But they also feed on these little weedy plants that come up in concrete sidewalks and things. And that's one reason why it has able to um, live in, in cities like that and do so well. <clears throat> and then one of our most common butterflies is Eastern Tail Blue. And uh, this is a clover feeder. Excuse me just a second. And these are tiny little things, but they will come to clover in your yard. They'll also come to some of your other smaller flowers. The males, <clears throat> which this is a male, are bright blue like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but the females are gray on top, and a lot of blues are like that. There are other species of blue, but we don't have uh, really any except this one in the azures. And in the springtime, uh, especially if you live in an area that is uh, fairly wooded, you know, I live somewhat close to Overton Park, so... I get some of these occasionally coming into my yard because they they've kind of came came out of Overton Park looking for other places to uh, to colonize, and it's a falcate orange tip. And uh, you, obviously, you can tell how it gets its name. But these are the males. The males have the orange tips. Uh, the females are solid white, but they have this uh, kind of gray marbling on the underside. A very attractive little butterfly in the spring, and as you can tell, it likes violets for nectar. Uh, painted ladies are really common. Uh, they're a very cosmopolitan butterfly. They're found all over the world. And these are one of those uh, butterflies I talk about that migrate that most people don't hear about because people only hear about monarch migrations. But painted ladies come up from Mexico every spring. And I've been in California and seen thousands of these things just streaming by me. It was incredible. And then in the fall, they do the same thing in reverse. And we notice them more in the fall. And um, you'll have a week or two, probably in the middle of September, where there'll be hundreds of painted ladies. And then the next week, they'll all be gone. So they they come through and visit, but it's brief. But they will stay in your garden for that week and, and fill up. And then a, a closely related species is Red Admiral. And um, they're one of these butterflies that you hardly ever see nectaring at flowers. They do some, but they love to come and perch in the foliage in gardens. 
And it's usually the males and they're patrolling for females and they're perching, waiting for a female to fly by. So even though you may not, it may not use your garden for nectar, it will probably use your garden as a perching place. And then our largest skipper in the area is a silver spotted skipper. And these are really common. Uh, you'll see these uh, bobbing through gardens and taking uh, nectar from a lot of different flowers. Uh, they feed on black locust. And, you know, and a lot of the vacant lots and, and kind of waste areas along the roadsides, there's a lot of black locust here. So this can be a common butterfly, especially if you're near an area that has some of the black locust. Uh, Zabulin skippers are one of the brighter, brightly colored skippers are bright yellow and orange. And the males uh, are this color. The females are brown, but with kind of the same pattern, but not the bright colors. But the males love to come in and out of the woodland. So they like to be right along the edges of the woods. So if your garden is near the woods, uh, you, can, you can have these pretty regularly. And then lastly, our uh, state butterfly is the zebra swallowtail. And like all the swallowtails, they, they love to nectar. And so uh, if you live near a wooded area, their host plant is pawpaws. So you do have to live close to a, a nice wooded area with pawpaw. But when you do, you'll definitely get zebra swallowtails coming to your garden. And, and they're our special state butterfly. So, And with that, I am done. And I will take any questions that we may have. Oh, thank you, Bart. I'm uh, getting my video back up here so I can look at the questions. Great. Okay, here's our first one. And and that was just great, Bart. It gave me some uh, ideas for things to add. Um, first is, do plants, do all the plants you mentioned require sun? And are there shade butterfly plants that you can suggest? Um, yeah, the phlox is one of the, the shadier plants. A lot of your spring ephemerals, they tend to grow in woodlands. So uh, they're not that shady when they're blooming because the trees haven't gotten their leaves yet. Um, you know, most butterflies are not going to be in the woodlands. And if they are, they're the kind of butterflies that don't really nectar. Uh, so tree sap and uh, fruit, rotting fruit are what you're going to attract for those. Um but there are, you know, some shade loving plants. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think. Um, I, I'm thinking of woodland violet, maybe. Uh, well, yeah, all the violets, but yeah, you could you could have some violets that will do well in the woods. Um, I'm trying to think of things that are later in the year, and I don't really know of anything. Um, I mean the. Yeah, I mean, you, you would just kind of have to walk in the woods. Some of the lobelias are pretty shade tolerant. Um, yeah, but that's pretty much it, because most of the things that butterflies are going to be attracted to, they take a lot of sun. Um, I mean, they can be partly shady, but they're going to have to have at least a couple of good hours of sun every day to do well. OK. All right, thanks. Um how do we isolate milkweed so it doesn't take over? Uh, it's kind of, think of it like bamboo. Uh, it's not really spreading too much from seed. So it's mainly the common milkweed is sending out runners like, like a bamboo would. Mm -hmm. And so any uh, barrier that would take care of bamboo would also take care of milkweed. So even just uh, surrounding your bed by, you know, a foot of concrete will probably be enough. Um, uh, the the metal barriers that you put down in the ground those would also also work well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have here's another question. I have a pollinator seed packet. It has been pre prepared and has several types of uh, several different types of seeds in it. I've read several different approaches to planting the garden, either getting planted started and then plant them, or broadcasting seed. Do you have a recommendation on prepping seeds and when when should I start? I've read uh -oh. a seed broadcast in the late fall. Okay. Um, most of the packaged, packaged seeds are already prepared and ready to germinate. 
So you can plant most of those in the early spring, right, kind of after the you know threat of uh, frost has passed. And they'll, most of those will all come up then and they'll be fine. Uh, if you don't have prepared seed, if you're harvesting your own seed from places, um, a lot of seed has to have a uh, stratification. So they have to go through the cold winter to be able to germinate the following year, the following spring. So you have to kind of read up a little bit just to make sure that you've got a seed that needs to be cold treated. Um, and a lot of the wildflowers are like that. They kind of have to have that winter cold to be able to germinate in the spring. But a package of seed, they're already done. They're ready to go. So you can just plant those in the spring. Uh, and like I said earlier, to immediately have a good effect in your garden, you probably want to buy a uh, full grown perennials from a nursery so that you can have an established garden. And then as you might want to expand or fill in from things that might not, have, you know, might not make it and die, then you can start raising seedlings and then incorporate them in because a perennial takes at least two years to be able to bloom in general. It, it typically doesn't bloom that first year. It's, it comes up from seed. So you're not going to have a lot if you only use seed. Now, a lot of times the cost is prohibitive if you have a very large garden or a large area. And a lot of people are restoring, uh, you know, pastures and fields and they want to uh, have them in wildflowers. And then it's almost uh, a necessity to be able to have uh, plants that come up from seed because you can't afford to plant, you know, a, a pot in a, in a field like that. So you can get uh, large amounts of seeds from some of the um, um larger seed companies that uh, handle wildflowers and um, you know, it will probably do fine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also thinking uh, to follow up Bart is that besides planting your perennials, you mentioned zinnias, which are a nice annual that people, so they could mix in good annuals with the perennials, which would be the stable base for the butterflies yes definitely and if you do plant annuals like that make sure that they have their own spot don't try to just broadcast them in amongst uh, your perennials because you will kind of compete out and your perennials especially if they're new they'll need all of the uh, moisture and sun and everything that they can get so kind of contain your uh, annuals to their own spot in the garden and you can just replant them every year in that spot well, that's a great suggestion. Another question, are butterfly populations stable? No. And I, I mean, no, in that even under normal circumstances, without any effects from pollution or climate change, whatever, you you know, that we've done, uh, insect populations boom and bust. And butterflies are the exact same way. So you'll have one year where you'll have an eruption of one species. And like I can give you an example, last year, uh, on the Jackson, Tennessee count that I do, um, we had 1,113 variegated fritillaries, which was an all-time record number for the count program. And it was just a, a boom year. Everywhere that we went, we saw a lot of variegated fritillaries. This year, it's back to normal. Uh, so you do have up and down years just normally. Uh, in general, though, I've been doing uh, butterfly counts now for 18 years. And in general, I would say <clears throat> that for the uh, 75 to 80% of all the species that we have around here, I think the numbers have gone down. Mm -hmm. It's not dramatic exactly, but we have seen a few of the things that are considered to be rare that have kind of disappeared. We haven't seen them in the, in the last several years. And I think that's kind of what's happening. We're, we're going to take care of the peripheral things and then we'll end up with the weedier species. Um, but yes, the numbers have gone down, I would say. Well, that's sad. <clears throat> but that's um, every insect, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, it's uh, and a lot of factors involved there. Yeah. Um, are there plants for rocky, sandy areas that tend to get a lot of rainwater? Hmm. Yes, um, you have to look hard for these things. Um, but a lot of the prairie plants, um, even though they may not be necessarily native to Tennessee, there are a lot of um, plants that grow in cedar glades and barrens 
uh, especially more toward Middle Tennessee. But uh, if you have an area that's dry and sandy and, you know, it's constantly having trouble with plants surviving, you might want to try to do some of the prairie plants or some of the plants that come from cedar glades and they'll do, they'll do better. And um, once things are established in those areas, they tend to do okay. It's the getting them planted and established. So if you can get them through those first two years, then they'll probably be fine. But it can be a little difficult to get something established, even a plant that will do well later on. Uh, does button bush require a wet environment? Uh, it needs a lot of moisture. So even if you've got it in a garden that you don't necessarily have a wet spot, you'll probably need to water it uh, fairly frequently for it to do well. Uh, they'll survive, but the foliage starts to get burnt and look look a little shaggy. But to have a really nice, beautiful button bush, uh, they need moisture. Yeah. But they're good because a lot of people complain, I've got this spot in my yard that always stays wet. I can't even hardly mow it. That would be a perfect situation for it. Um, I will just say I have had button bush grow in amazingly what I would consider a hostile place like the parking lot island. I think maybe once they get their roots, you know, like so many things, once it's established. Yeah. Um, it seems like a very tough plant to me, but maybe that's just my experience. So. No, they are tough plants, but yeah. if you look in nature, they're very rarely true. away from too much water. That's for sure. Okay, we have clethra plants in a wet shade area that attract mostly bees, but butterflies too. I think that's yep. just a statement. So. Yeah, yeah, and they're 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 really good. Uh, clethras. The only issue with them around here is. Yeah, you do You do need to have some shade because they tend to be a little bit cooler growing plant. So I don't think they could take uh, like full sun here for very long. They would probably struggle in that kind of environment. But with a partial shade, especially if it's shaded in the afternoon, they'll probably do fine. And they're great for bees, especially bees. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Mary, Mary Ellen says, thank you much. And is it possible to help support pollinators with only an apartment patio? Do you have any suggestions? Yes. Um, I mean, a lot of these plants, you can, uh, some of the smaller perennials do well in pots. Uh, there's a ton of annuals that you can get besides zinnias, uh, pentas, uh, lantana. There's, you know, um, uh, even impatiens. I've seen a lot of uh, butterflies go to impatiens, especially the old timey impatiens, not the New Guinea type. Um, you know, yeah, passion, I mean, passion vine might, in a container, it might work on a patio. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, you, you can be creative, but, you know, a lot of the, the annual plants that people think of as butterfly plants, they do fine in, in pots also. Okay, here's another question. Are hosta flowers any good for pollinators? I have some blooming right now. Yes, uh, I've seen bumblebees a lot of times on hostas. I don't see butterflies on them, but I have seen bumblebees on them, especially. How does orange butterfly weed rank? I have been cult cultivating it for years in my wild garden. Well, I'm assuming you're talking about the butterfly weed, the native. There's also the tropical butterfly weed that's orange. Uh, it doesn't have the big bushiness to it. It's more of a tall singular stem. Um, as far as a monarch host plant, which is, I guess, what they're asking about, um, butterfly weed is not one of the better ones, but monarchs will use whatever is available. They're not that picky as long as it is a milkweed. Uh, so if you've got, you know, the butterfly weed, it will, it will bring in a monarch or two, definitely. Uh, common milkweed tends to be the one that the experts have said is the best as far as providing the chemicals that will make them distasteful to predators. And basically you can judge it by the amount of latex. That is when you break the leaf, how much of the white milky sticky juice comes out, the more of that, the better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Where can I get good local trees and advice on where to plant them? 
Well, like I said, I'm not the best at gardener. Uh, so I, I don't really know. And I, I hesitate saying anything about, um, nurseries. Um, but most, most nurseries will have, you know, the typical trees that grow around here, just make sure that it's something that's native. It can be a cultivar. Uh, I think that would be fine. Uh, but, uh, typically, you know, your oak trees, they're going to be okay. Um, any kind of uh, elm. Uh, it, it, here in Memphis, you basically can just like let an area grow up a little bit and you'll get some tree saplings and then just, you can plant those. You know, it's not it's not difficult to find a, a tree around here if you just kind of look for the weedy area. They're small, but they grow quickly. And then just for advice, there's Tennessee Native Plant Society and... Um... You know, lands the landscaping uh, brochures that they did. Yeah, to, uh, the uh, Tennessee, the Tennessee Native, uh, Tennessee Invasive Plant Council, they have a lot of uh, brochures and information on their website to help you find alternatives that are native to some of the non-native plants, and it will also kind of tell you uh, kind of uh, habitat and environment that they would grow in that would be equivalent in your yard uh it'll also give you a west tennessee list uh you know middle tennessee east tennessee list so that's a good resource is the tennessee Nate, uh, tennessee invasive plant council their website has a lot of that information yeah okay and you know lauren if you reach out or it wasn't lauren whoever asked that question um reach out to uh, wolf river conservancy as well and i i can suggest several uh resources that might help you. Okay, next question. For apartment-friendly gardens, uh, what grows best in a smaller raised box environment? Uh, like I said, a lot of the annuals. Um, I think pentas, P-E-N-T-A-S, is uh, an excellent pot plant for a, a patio or a balcony. And um, that's a really good butterfly plant. Now, uh, granted, you may not see a lot just because you're going to have a smaller area that you're going to have flowers blooming, but every little bit counts. I mean, if you're a hungry bee or a hungry butterfly and you happen to, you know, stumble upon it as it flies by your building or your house, then, um, you know, they're going to be thankful. Okay. Are there any butterfly societies in the Mid-South? There is not a, a chapter. Uh, the North American Butterfly Association is what I belong to, but we do not have a local chapter. Uh, but uh, you can go to the uh, website, uh, naba.org, and you can get all kinds of information. And you can uh, find out information about gardening. They have a uh, magazine that comes out quarterly, Butterfly Gardener. Um, you can... Uh, learn how to have your garden become a registered monarch way station. Um, there's all kinds of uh, things that they can provide you information. And uh, Monarch Watch is also another organization that is very good. And um, at times they will supply uh, milkweed plants to people who re request them. Um, and you can also enter in your data of, of your sightings to Monarch Watch. Uh, NABA does the uh, butterfly count program that I'm a part of. Um, I have five different uh, butterfly count circles that I do around the West Tennessee. So if you're interested in that, you can contact me. And uh, we have uh, a count coming up in uh, Shelby Forest, September the 9th. And if you're interested, you can meet us at the Visitor Center at 9.30 in the morning that Saturday, and we would love to have you, and you can learn a lot about butterflies by just hanging out with us. A lot of fun, too. Okay, I have a lot of aphids and ants on my milkweed. What's the best way to get rid of them? Uh, I don't, I, you know, other than just mechanically removing them, or you could... Uh, take a tissue and, and dab it in 70% ethanol or isopropanol rubbing alcohol, that will kill the aphids. Um, it's, it's always a struggle. Milkweed typically has a lot of aphids. The plant doesn't mind 
it, it doesn't really weaken the plant that much. It's just kind of unsightly. Um, there are milkweed bugs, the kind of red and black uh, beetle looking bug that uh, is on milkweed usually, but they're not an issue either. Um, I wouldn't worry about aphids and things too much unless you start to notice that they have sucked so much of the juice out that the plant begins to look like it's withering. But I would suggest you just take some rubbing alcohol with a tissue and rub up and down the stems where the aphids are and that will kill them. Okay. What are your thoughts on devil's walking stick, Aurelia spinosa? Uh, it's probably not the best garden plant just because of the thorns. Of course, people love roses. Uh, it, it It's not, I mean, I love it as a, a plant in nature because it does attract a lot of uh, bees and butterflies and flies. It's It attracts a lot of flies to pollinate it. Um, but I've seen a lot of butterflies on devil's walking stick too. It just doesn't really have what I would call a, a pretty appearance because it's all so lanky and leggy and, you know, I, I haven't ever seen anybody grow it in a garden. Yeah, me either. That's that's a great question. Um, which plants, I guess, of the ones that you mentioned, Bart, which plants are deer resistant? Uh, all lilies are horribly not deer resistant. <laughs> <laughs> Anything, uh, you can kind of almost tell by how juicy the stems and leaves are. Just kind of think of it that way. Deer are really, uh, they prefer to have uh, soft, juicy leaves. So anything that's got a harder, leathery leaf is, leaf is going to be more deer resistant. So some of the shrubs, like plethora, I think is probably fairly deer resistant. Um some of the dogwoods, not the flowering dogwood that we think of, but there are other dogwoods that have small clusters of white flowers. Those are fairly deer resistant. Um, you know, the milk, milkweeds, they probably don't like milkweeds. Probably not the milkweeds that have a lot of latex. No, milkweeds are probably okay. I don't think they particularly care for sunflowers. But uh, don't don't if you're if you've got deer, don't plant lilies and don't plant anything that's juicy because you're just basically giving them dessert. Yeah. <laughs> OK. And then someone asked about chess trees. Lots of le bees on blooms. Don't see butterflies. Uh, which kind of tree? Chast. C-H-A-S. Oh, yeah. Uh, cast tree. Um, I have seen I have seen some butterflies. Uh, they're typically uh, smaller skippers and hair streaks. Um, and that's another thing is uh, a lot of people only notice the large butterflies. They don't know that there are dime-sized butterflies. And they're very important as far as the small flowered plants or plants that have a very flat flower and a flower head. Those are the kind of of butterflies that are attracted to that. So you do need to have a mix of flowers with long tubes for the, you know, the sulfurs and the skippers, and then flat flowered plants that uh, the little guys can access uh, nectar for. But yeah, I've seen, I've seen a few butterflies. They're not what I would consider a big butterfly attractor, but they do get a lot of bees in. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, Paula is, has been nice enough to mention that uh, Lichterman Nature Center has a nice selection of native plants for sale right now, and that yep. she used several milkweed plants a couple of weeks ago. And then um, I wanted to end this, uh, Bart, with uh, one question for the benefit of our viewers. If, is, um, if Can you suggest any books about butterflies or butterfly gardening that people might want to be? Uh, like I said, uh, you know, NABA puts out its quarterly magazine, uh, butterfly gardener that's a good little resource and you can join NABA it's uh I think I think thirty dollars twenty five or thirty dollars a year forty they've got different levels but I think the bottom one is twenty five or thirty dollars uh you also get the American butterflies magazine quarterly which is a really nice kind of you know glossy publication uh, and it'll give you a lot of information about butterflies uh you it's always nice to have a field guide um I like uh 
the Butterflies Through Binoculars series by the NABA president. Um, there's also uh, uh, the Ken Kaufman series of books is good. Audubon uh, books are good. Um, as far as a gardening book specifically for butterflies, I'm really not familiar with one. I know there's got to be some out there. Uh, but anything that talks about pollinators, it be anything that talks about bees or butterflies, they're all it's it's interchangeable. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I'd also suggest Rita Venable's book just for the butterflies of Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's really good. And then there, someone uh, sent you one more question. What species of perennial sunflowers do you recommend? I like the ashy sunflower. Uh, it's really good. Jerusalem artichoke around here is, a, is an excellent bedding plant. It's a big bushy sunflower with large leaves. So it really looks substantial and has large flowers. And you can buy that. I mean, that's that's been in the trade for a long time, Jerusalem artichoke. And it's edible. But it's a sunflower. Okay. Great. And then uh, someone, two people just want to thank you. Thank you for, for, thank you both for informative and motivating information. And someone else said this was excellent. Thank you. So there you go, Bart. You did it. Okay. Great. I guess, I guess it was okay then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I think you're welcome. Are interested. And, um, and they will be able to, uh, refer back to this program because we've recorded it and um, so people can uh, hear you over and over if they want to get all that great wow <laughs> thanks everyone for joining us and um bart thank you so much for for uh sharing your time with us it's all right good. well thanks thanks for having me okay see you soon i hope all right yes i hope so okay bye bart all right bye